Uh, I'm Charles Cockell. All right, what do you do? I, uh, I'm at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm an astrobiologist, but with a focus on microbiology. I study microbes in extreme environments. You study microbes in a group. All right, are we alone? Are we alone? I mean, I, people love to make predictions on this. And I always say, I don't know, and people say, you're sitting on a fence. But I think my response to that is, we truly don't know, and that is a correct scientific answer. It is a question we don't have an answer to. Uh, we want to find out. I think as um, astrobiology has developed, one of the most astonishing things over the last few decades is the discovery of watery environments in the universe, in our own solar system, uh, icy moons, and the discoveries of exoplanets. So we're certainly getting closer to maybe having some sort of answer, at least in our local neighborhood. But uh, the fact is, at the moment, we don't know what the answer to that is, and that's why we're interested in pursuing astrobiology. A lot of people say, oh, we're probably not alone because the universe is just so big and we found so many planets recently that that uh, increases the chances from what they were before, and so they think we're probably not alone. Yeah. Uh, the idea that uh, there are just a vast number of stars and therefore potential planets in the universe uh, makes it more likely there's life uh, is at the moment at least a statistically flawed argument. I mean, let's say, for example, there's a step in the origin of life that is so improbable that even the numbers of planets and stars in the known universe mean that the probability of life elsewhere um, is very low. Now, I grant that with the knowledge we have, that seems increasingly unlikely. We're beginning to understand how molecules uh, may be able to self-replicate, quite simple molecules how they become enclosed in membranes, uh, which seems a relatively easy thing to do if you have um, lipid-like molecules around. It does seem that the steps in the origin and emergence of life uh, are not so improbable, but we still don't know completely all the steps that go from simple organic compounds to a self-replicating organism that undergoes uh, Darwinian evolution. It could be that there is a step in there that is so improbable that the number of stars and planets in the universe makes the origin of life extremely rare. And it's important as a scientist and to get the statistics right to be open to that possibility as we don't know about uh, the origin of life. But this, I think, is one of the major challenges with the origin of life community is to tell us uh, whether we can put probabilities on all those stages and use the abundance of planets in the known universe to say something about the likelihood of life elsewhere. Do you have a candidate for what a very, very improbable step might be? Well, I suppose that one step um, could be uh, the emergence of a, uh, a stable uh, genetic code that can um, encode uh, three-dimensional structures like proteins. That, is, that remains one of the mysteries in astrobiology, how you go from essentially a one-dimensional molecule to three-dimensional uh, functional molecules like proteins. But even there, you know, people are making um, substantial inroads into understanding the thermodynamics of folding of proteins, uh, interactions between nucleic acids and proteins, and building models of how those things may occur. That's not my area of expertise, but I'm impressed by the numbers of directions people are now coming at in trying to understand the origin of life, physics approaches, uh, biochemical approaches, chemical approaches. And I have to say, watching it as an outsider, as someone who's a microbiologist, um, I, I do find it difficult to see a single step that I would say was so improbable, or to give an example of that, that it would mean that life throughout the universe was, was, uh, was improbable itself. I simply leave that question open because I think as a, as a scientist one should be open to the possibility that there is a step in there. It's actually very difficult, I think, to find an example. But maybe that's a good thing. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? I think the question, are we alone, is an important question. Um, it's practically an important question because the pursuit of that question uh, takes us to a more fundamental understanding of, of biology and life. And these things have applications uh, in areas such as medicine, how do proteins fold, how, do, how are they structured, how does the genetic code work, uh, even can we make new genetic codes, which is now no longer theory but a practical uh, laboratory-based um, enterprise, and those sorts of things are having direct practical applications. So asking the question, are we alone, um, drives us in a whole variety of interesting research directions in biochemistry, biology, and physics that have uh, direct practical uses. But I think there's also an important um, philosophical aspect to it, which is that 
asking the question, are we alone, um, is very much part of what civilization is. You know, we eat, uh, we go to sleep, we, we build things. I mean, a lot of animals do that. And for me, what puts the civil in civilization is asking questions like, uh, are we alone in the universe? As far as we know, um, there is no single species throughout the uh, three and a half, four billion year history of biological evolution other than the human species that has ever asked the question, are we alone in the universe? It really does differentiate our minds from other animals. It doesn't make our minds necessarily special, but it does represent a level of cognitive sophistication that we can ask that question and go about trying to answer it. So I think it is important because it's the, it's the full use of our capacities to understand the universe around us and uh, that's philosophically important for understanding what we are and where we fit into the, the grander scheme of, of the origin and evolution of the universe. And as I said earlier, I think that um, on a more uh, pragmatic level, there are practical uh, applications of research that comes out of pursuing that question. So you think that the uh, unexamined life is not worth living and that the species that goes extinct with the most self-awareness wins? Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. The species that, that goes uh, extinct with the most self-awareness wins. Well, you know, extinction is something we also have to try and deal with. I, I, I think it's a good idea to think about asteroid diversion schemes. Um, we don't know whether we're going to become extinct next week. I think that's just uh, um, a necessary um, uh, ongoing risk of existence. But that shouldn't distract us from taking an optimistic view, which is that our civilization has a future. And as we build that future and try and enrich our civilization, its knowledge and uh, the way in which we live, even just amongst ourselves and with the rest of the biosphere, questions like, are we alone in the universe? is part of that enriched existence. It's part of the pursuit of knowledge. It's part of the scientific enterprise of, of understanding what we are. Um, but I completely agree that in, in the pursuit of that question, uh, we also need to keep focused on some more practical things like what might make us extinct. And it's a good idea to avoid those things. Well, I, I notice when I go to parties, for example, people who are very, very self-conscious don't dance. And so there's a, there's, in other words, self-awareness is not an un, unlimited good, and it might be just better to just live life uh, without it. So, yeah. but, but you're making the case that, oh, we want to know who we are and understand how we fit into the universe, and that most of us, we agree that, yes, that's a good thing, but I guess uh, not always. No, not all of us. It's true. I mean, you know, you can make an argument that uh, we can just carry on existing and then not ask these questions. But, you know, are we, are we alone in the universe as part, I would say, of a family of questions uh, that includes, you know, uh, how did the Earth form? Um, are, are there asteroids out there? And, and then directly from there, do some of them threaten us? You know, the dinosaurs lived in the unconscious state of nature and they did not think about um, whether they might go extinct. They did not build a space program. I don't think they had the cognitive capacity to do that anyway. But the point is that if you as an intelligent species to decide you're going to not answer those questions, almost retreat into the unconscious state of nature and not ask big questions, is to let go of a capacity that you have that enriches the lives, I think, of everyone, even those people who don't ask those questions, ultimately find them interesting. And as I say, those questions lead in very practical directions. In the pursuit of the understanding of the solar system, you learn about the, uh, the distribution of asteroids and where they are, and as you build telescopes, you map them. Uh, one day we may be able to prevent uh, the same mechanism of extinction that ended the dinosaurs. So I, I would keep this point that the question of are we alone in the universe is part of, an in, uh, of enriching the culture of civilization. Not everyone has to answer it uh, or think about it, but those people who are not interested in it should also be aware of the fact that these questions uh, rebound with direct practical applications for our civilization as well and thinking about our long-term future. Hmm. So you think it's good to find out how we fit into the universe? I think it is, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a, good, that's, a, that's a good question in itself. What do you mean by good? I mean, I personally, in this personal view, I don't, I don't believe there's any preordained purpose to living. I think we're just organic matter on a planet. One can easily take a nihilistic view of that and say, well, there's no real point in asking any any questions because we're all going to be dead in a hundred years and 
uh, why would we ask these questions anyway? Who cares whether we go extinct from an asteroid next week or in a million years' time? Um, but I, I think that's, that's not a good way to live as individual human beings. We do have a form of self-consciousness and sitting around just eating. It's just pretty boring, actually. It's a pretty <laughs> boring existence. If you're going to suddenly develop self-awareness and consciousness, yeah, you can sit around and just eat, and that's fine. That, that would be a perfectly acceptable decision for our civilization to teach, to, to take, rather. But, but there are so many exciting things to think about that enrich our organic existence on this planet. And sitting around as lumps of organic matter, thinking about are there other types of matter out there that behave in the same way, it's a pretty neat thing to think about. Now, Carl Sagan, I think, famously said something like, uh, humanity is the, the universe is a way of becoming aware of itself. Yeah. What do you I, think of that comment? I think it has a fantastically appealing rhetorical resonance. I'm not sure I quite understand what it means <laughs> because I don't think the universe is trying to do anything. It's just uh, matter behaving in certain ways and on one planet uh, a lump of matter uh, incorporated a code that replicated and you get what we call biology. It's just an interesting subset of matter that happens to do some interesting things. So the, the idea of the universe would be trying to understand itself, I, I'm not sure I understand what that really means, although it's, it's, it sounds like uh, a wonderful thing to say. I just think we are, and here we are on this planet, and now we are here, uh, we might as well think about what to do with ourselves that's interesting, and thinking about whether there's uh, other matter elsewhere in the universe that, that contemplates the nature of the universe um, it is an interesting thing to think about. Well, do you think a bloodhound is the, is the way in which the universe is learning to smell itself? <laughs> yeah, <maybe>. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that in some sense shows the absurdity of the question. Okay. I mean, is a microbe a, a universe's way of, of, of trying to replicate matter in some particular way? I mean, you know, you can create all sorts of varieties of that question. I, I, I'm not sure I understand the whole concept of the universe trying to understand anything, because I don't think the universe is doing that. But aren't you partially motivated in your study of astrobiology by wanting to know how you fit into the universe, who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's, I think, connected again with is there life elsewhere? Um, uh, am I, do I belong to the only civilization in the universe or are there other ones? So I think the self-reflective interest in who you are and how you fit in is again part of that general family of questions in which the question, are we alone in the universe, is central, I think. Now, when I asked you, are we alone in the universe, what did you understand by the word we? I, I would um, think about um, we as uh, probably replicating matter on Earth. <laughs> So life on Earth? Life on Earth. You said replicating matter. Do you, is that the same as life? I'm talking about life, yeah. Replicating matter is undergoing evolution. I'm just trying to sort of simplify um, the cohort of material. So is this phenomenon that we happen to call life, and we can argue about the definition of that, but is, is this material we call life unique to the universe? That's what I think about by we. I mean, the, the subset of that, which is um, a self-reflecting intelligence that can build radio telescopes and explore the rest of the universe, that's a, certainly a fascinating subset of that question. Are there specifically intelligences? But, uh, but I'm also just happy to know, or would be happy to know, uh, is there other, type of, um, other types of life elsewhere in the universe that's similar to life on Earth? Do you think those two questions have different answers? I think they do, um, because I think that there is uh, probably more likely to be microbial life on other planets, um, just from a statistical consideration of uh, a four and a half um, billion year old planet and the length of time um, during that history there was just microbial life. Of course there may be older planets, I mean if you've got lots of, <laughs> if, there's, if there's intelligence on the Earth for the next four or five billion years then we might be looking back in five billion years time and saying well half of the history of any planet is intelligent. So, so there's a biased view on the percentage of the time uh, that a planet is microbial, which is uh, a bias created by the short duration of intelligence that has led to asking that question. Um, but based on what we do know about microbial life and the tenure that it's had on, on Earth, the time it's spent here and the, the time it took to go from microbial life to intelligence, one might suppose that microbial life would be more common than intelligent life. And of course there's a a bigger question that underpins that, which is once you get microbes, is intelligence inevitable? 
Yeah, so what do you think about our ability to answer that question? I think, again, like the origin of life, I think we're making impressive headway into trying to understand the inevitability of various evolutionary transitions. And people have, of course, enormously varied views on that. But we see, for example, multicellularity uh, amongst microbes, not true differentiation of cells, but we see how uh, organisms cooperating is a, is a fundamental feature of, of the biosphere. It's not an uncommon thing. Uh, the process, for example, of endosymbiosis, incorporating um, uh, microorganisms into other organisms and creating organelles that allow you to ramp up energy production that, that led to um, uh, highly powered up eukaryotic cells through the mitochondrion. We see now that's quite common. Endosymbiosis has occurred many times. So, so various stages that, that lead to complexity, to complex life, um, seem to be uh, not uncommon, but that last question of uh, will, will evolution select for an intelligence in animals, it, that actually is quite a difficult thing to know whether, um, whether that's inevitable. I mean, for example, it's a fairly trivial point, but the dinosaurs uh, gained mastery of land, sea, and air for about 165 million years uh, without uh, being um, harassed, as far as we know, by other animals. The, the mammals are very much at the edge of the biosphere, and yet they did not evolve intelligence. So, you know, maybe, maybe some of these things are inevitable, but the timing may not be inevitable. Well, they had brains, but you said they didn't evolve intelligence. What does that mean, to not evolve intelligence? That oh, means they didn't make telescopes? Yes, I think that's exactly what I mean. Okay. They didn't build a, a technological civilization that's left any uh, imprint in the rock record. We see no evidence that they were close to building a uh, an equivalent of the Apollo program. Um, and, I, and I don't think, although yet again you could ask what would be preserved 65 million years later in the rock record, but there certainly doesn't seem to be any evidence of any large scale tool building ability that led to the sort of intensity of, of tool building that we would think of as a civilization that might leave an imprint in the rock record. And they certainly didn't manage to prevent, after 165 million years, an asteroid impact from occurring. Now you use the term mastery of land, sea, and air. I guess uh, that means the biggest animal at the time is by definition, your definition, the master of land, sea, and air, not the plants that are around or the fungi or the bacteria for that matter. Why would, why would the largest animal be the master? So when I say mastery, what I mean is um, dominance in many ecological niches. Of course the plants dominated their niches, but we're, I'm specifically talking about it in the context of an organism that looked like it might have had the capability to develop a, a neurological complexity leading to, uh, leading to intelligence. So when I say dominant, I mean amongst uh, metazoa, amongst animals that might have a capacity for intelligence. Okay. Course, so so plants will just, they will never have the mastery for intelligence. Well, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's an interesting question. I think there doesn't seem to be a mechanism for um, uh, localized concentrations of, of neurological complexity in a plant, at least we don't, we don't see that in any examples of plants on the earth that would suggest that plants have the capacity to lead to the sort of intelligence that we're talking about, for example, building. Now, if, if we, uh, Stephen Jay Gould has talked about replaying the tape of life yeah. starting at the Cambrian yeah. explosion and uh, yeah. he, he in this thought experiment, he thinks that uh, something like humans would never re-evolve. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And on the other hand, one of your countrymen, Simon Conway Morris, thinks, of course humans yeah. will re-evolve. So do you take a, what is your view on this issue? Well, first of all, I think one has to be clear about what you mean by rerunning the tape of evolution and something similar happening. I mean, it's a trivial point that, of course, if you rerun the tape of evolution, you wouldn't end up with exactly the same biosphere. Uh, so, you so would or you wouldn't? You wouldn't. I mean, you're you not, would or wouldn't? You, you would not end up with not. exactly the same biosphere. You know, dogs that look exactly like, well, actually, sorry, I shouldn't say dogs, those are human creations, but wolves that look exactly like wolves, or cats that look exactly like cats that we have. There's clearly going to be variation, and we've seen this through the history of life on Earth. So in that sense, uh, Gould is right, but I think on, on a trivial detail level. But the broader question of would you see the same general trajectories of evolution uh, would you see the same sorts of um, organisms emerging? I think life on Earth is, is very constrained by uh, simple laws of physics. For example, if you look at 
um, subterranean animals like moles and worms. Um, they're slender and pointy. Uh, that's just an organic manifestation of P equals F over A. Well, you think moles are slender and pointy? <laughs> well, generally. I mean, they're cylindrical animals. They have pointy little faces. They have <coughs> stubby toes. And that's all about tunneling their way through soil. That's an organic manifestation of P equals F over A. And if you look at a mole in Australia... Well, wait, 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 wait. They're both animals. Yeah. And they have a common ancestor, let's say, 600 million years ago. So 600 million, here's 4 billion years ago, 600 million years ago is just like yesterday. And so they have a very, very recent common ancestor which makes them both animals. So they have shared lots and lots and lots of things. Mm -hmm. So, but you want to invoke physics and then pretend that the common ancestor was, you know, doesn't matter. Well, I think what I'm saying is that um, the structures of, of animals, and we have to accept they all came from a common ancestor, you know, 550, 600 million years ago. But, but tightly constrains uh, the way in which organisms evolve for particular environments. But that's um, already given a very lots and lots of shared baggage. I mean, for well, example, fungi mm -hmm. or something deeper, a billion years ago, common mm -hmm. ancestor, well, they don't are long and skinny, and they don't share PV equals whatever physics you wanted to evolve to, to induce there. So, well, in many ways, you're pretending do. it's physics, and no, then no, no. I mean, in many ways, they do. I mean, fungi are, do form hyphae that, and people have measured the pressure that a hyphae can exert on a surface, and it's incredible pressure. And they push their way through rocks, and they form. Uh, long so you think hyphae and worms? There's a commonality there due to physics. Yeah, I do. Okay. I think uh, it's about getting through substrates, okay. and being pointy and long is a good way to get through substrates. But if you're, if you're a eukaryote. Uh, and actually, if you're if you're a micro, how about a bacteria? They'd have yeah, long yeah. and skinny too. Um, yeah, some fungi, you know, form these um, uh, hyphae that, that grow through rocks and. I'm about talking about uh, bacteria. Or going through uh, some bacteria are, are, are filamentous as well. Whether they use that to uh, bore through substrates, I'm not sure whether that's really necessary in porous rocks. How about viruses? Uh, well, viruses. Um, they long and skinny too, so they get through holes. <laughs> no, because they they really have no capacity to replicate. Um, but I mean, what did they do replicate? Well, you might ask. You might ask an interesting question of whether the physical structure of some viruses is optimized to get through substrates, mm -hmm. particularly viruses that infect uh, bacteria and rocks. So that's yeah. an interesting question I think to ask. But but I think the general point I'm trying to make is that there is enormous convergence um, in different forms. And I think if you reran the tape of evolution, you would whatever the the, the ancestry of an organism that 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 went through water or tunneled through a planetary substrate, you would see it converge on similar physical forms, whatever its bones were made of or whatever its ancestry was. So I think if you landed on a planet that was, or you re-ran the tape of evolution on the Earth, you would see recognizable things, um, recognizable forms of life. You mean there would be a division between animals, plants, and fungi, for example? Well, that's more difficult to answer. I mean, the, the what, what do you mean by recognizable? What do you mean then? I mean, I mean in the forms of organisms. So you mean if you assume to have animals, then among the animals there'll be recognizably pa some patterns there yes, exactly. that are close to what we already yes, have. Yeah. So once you have animals, but mm -hmm. let's go. Let's ask: Will we have animals on another planet? Should we expect animals? Well, because uh, that's what you're assuming when yeah, you say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are these are very difficult questions to answer because, of course, you're necessarily blinded by your own knowledge of evolution on the Earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very good question if you've got. Uh, but you are trying to you are answering them as if there were not a big problem. You were saying, okay, if you have animals, then you would have these similarities. But I'm saying, okay, mm -hmm. well, what makes you think you have animals? Because that's obviously the assumption you're making. Oh well, so so one might rephrase that. I mean, in, in retrospect, by saying. If you have organisms on a planet, they will develop similar forms, whether they're moving through water or, or tunneling through you substrates. Mean animals. Uh, well, um, you know, we could go back to plants and think about are they inevitable? Um, why aren't there more photosynthetic animals, for instance? Uh, th these are these are interesting questions. I mean, John Maynard Smith asked, why aren't there horned birds? I mean, there are a lot of interesting questions in biology about why there aren't things. I think these are difficult things to, to answer. In terms of the separation of major branches of, of um, complex life into plants and animals, is that inevitable? Would we always see plants and animals? Do we have any um, way of addressing that? I don't think it, there's an easy way to address that. 
and yet you were assuming that there were animals on other planets when I asked you about sim physics, and you were trying to use it in physics, and that physics plus assumption of animals to answer the question. Yeah, so I think we have to think about the, the, the coarseness with which we're answering that question of if you rerun the table of evolution and you landed on a planet, would you see recognizable things? And that's always been Simon Conway Morris's point, is that you would land on a planet and it wouldn't look so alien as it seemed. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's a valid point. I think one could get into lower levels of structure and start saying, so would you have plants and animals? I think you would have animal-like things. I think things that have locomotion and can move around, that's uh, uh, an evolutionarily successful thing to do to get resources. Is that because you're an animal? I think it's because of accessibility of food. If you can get sunlight, then it's okay to sit there as long as you're in a place where there's sunlight. Mm -hmm. If you don't use sunlight, but you use organic matter and oxygen as a redox couple, um, it makes sense to move around because that organic material generally doesn't just drop from the sky unless something happens to plant dies and blows over to you. So you can understand that there's, there's evolutionary selection pressures that might rationally split something that's photosynthetic and essentially sessile and just sits there, and something that uses another uh, re a different redox couple like organic carbon and oxygen, where there is suddenly a selection pressure where if you can move around and eat bits of organic matter, you have an advantage. So one could, from an energetic point of view, start thinking about maybe there is some inevitability about sessile organisms that collect stellar, stellar photons and things that move around and, and accumulate organic matter. Are you telling me that you think there are no planets, Earth-like planets, with just plants and fungi? Oh, uh, well... Is that what you just said? No, no, I, I, uh, I think that's... I'm not saying that the evolution of those two things are contemporaneous. I mean, indeed, on, on the Earth, during the Devonian... Well, I mean, animals started... To, early tetrapods started to move onto land roughly about the same time as plants. And one could imagine, um, I guess, uh, a planet where you have sort of photosynthetic organisms like cyanobacteria or the endosymbiotic uh, uh, evolutionary development algae moving on to land masses and maybe forming some sort of early plants and for whatever reason a delay in some sort of animal life moving on to that. Delay? So, delay it, compared to the timing it happened on Earth? Yeah, yeah. Or um, what about the non-existence of animals and just a planet with plants and fungi? I, I, I personally find that um, difficult to believe because I think once you have, um, well, let me take a step back. A lot of this depends upon the, the geological conditions on the planet to get a rise in oxygen to create uh, redox couples a redox couple where you can use oxygen with organic matter and have something where there is then a selection pressure to be able to move around and eat other, to eat other organic matter, what we recognize in animals. If you have a planet where that redox couple is not prevalent, uh, where there is just uh, the only use of organic matter in energy acquisition is things like iron reduction and sulfate reduction where the organic matter is being used as an electron donor that we see in microbes on the Earth, but where the energy available is some 10 to 100 times less than aerobic respiration using oxygen, then I think one could easily imagine a planet where you've got photosynthesis uh, with maybe um, cyanobacteria equivalent or plant equivalents, um, but where the use of organic matter as an electron donor is limited to um, anaerobic metabolisms using things like sulfate and iron as the electron acceptor, and where there are no animals. So yes, I could imagine planet where you've got um, photosynthesis but no animals because there's not been a rise in oxygen in the atmosphere. And we think on the earth there was a delay right between the, the emergence of cyanobacteria producing oxygen and um, the removal of all the reductants and ultimately a rise in oxygen in the earth's atmosphere. So do you think fungi are inevitable then on a plant, on a life, on a planet with life? Um, fungi are, are rather good at, at using low levels of, of, of oxygen when it's available, and you find them sometimes in association <laughs> with things like cyanobacteria. Yeah. So, uh, so as long as you've got something that does photosynthesis, whatever's happening in the atmospheric, uh, in atmospheric conditions on the planetary scale, you're always going to have oases of oxygen, even just around, um, around photosynthetic organisms. So I could see 
um, organisms evolving with complexity that use oxygen. They may not be animals who have that amount of oxygen, but fun fungi like analogs might okay. evolve. All right. So <laughs> in astrobiology, yeah. uh, a lot of people, particularly Simon Conway Morris, have, have used the following logic. If we can find a structure, a feature that has evolved independently multiple times on Earth, then that feature or that structure becomes good candidate for what we should expect elsewhere on mm -hmm. other planets that might have life. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that logic? Uh, I, think that, I think the general approach is a good one to look for things like that, but of course you've got to be aware that, I mean, continuing the discussion a bit earlier, we do, all animals come from this common ancestor 600 million years ago, so if you find common things, you've got to think about, is that a result of history in organisms? Are we looking at something that's um, uh, either uh, genetically predisposed from, from the genes that animals have that might be common to all animals? Is there some sort of structure that, that, that the earliest animals have that we see um, in all animals, or reappearing, for example, in animals even that look independent, but in fact, it comes from common structural constraints, historical constraints. Um, but it would seem sensible that at least convergent evolution is one way you could start to approach the question of do we see um, uh, structures or features in animals that we might be able to demonstrate are genetically completely independent but have evolved through selection pressures that then one might think could they could they have evolved elsewhere? If, I mean, if all life if all life has a common ancestor, how can anything be completely genetically independent? In your words. Well, I I, I think you could have. Um, uh, I mean, it would depend on the, the 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 origin of all the genes in a particular structure. I mean, for example, eyes, rhodopsins are very deep branching, so eyes have evolved multiple times, but. Is that because the rhodopsin genes are there and certain other genes for various parts of eyes that have, um, th that have evolved because the fundamental, the fundamental uh, detection apparatus is there for picking up photons? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that's always going to be a difficult thing. Uh, you would have to find something where the genes have um, uh, evolved from uh, either other genes or have, or, or have evolved uh, completely, <laughs> completely, <laughs> completely what? In a completely novel genetic sequence that is not found in in, in particular animals, and I, I'm trying to think whether that's even possible. I think it's not. Yeah, but, uh, I, but uh, I, you can yeah. speculate that. Anyway, that's what the debate is about. But but, but yeah, I mean, the, the fundamental point is that we all have a common ancestor, and certain things that we see that are convergent. Um, have their roots in genes that, that are common to many animals, if not all animals, which throws a spanner in the works of simply writing down that some people tend to do, oh, eyes have evolved this number of times, therefore that shows it's inevitable, or this feature has evolved a certain number of times. But obviously it's evolved in a lineage where those, uh, those structures, I, I mentioned rhodopsin for, uh, and various molecules for detecting photons, those structures are there for detecting the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so is it surprising that the detection of the electromagnetic spectrum as a mechanism for sensing your environment has evolved multiple times in animals? Um, so I think there's some way to go. And it, it goes back to, uh, I guess, the fundamental point is that it's this N equals 1 problem of having a single biosphere. We're, we're trying to have discussions here on a sample size of one, which most of us do not like to do quite rightly in science. We don't have any choice, um, but one should rightly feel uh, uncomfortable about having any conversations like this. And I think it goes back to the very first conversation, which is why are we ans answering, asking the question, are we alone in the universe? And one reason why we might be trying to answer that question is at least to try and get to n equals two. So we can answer questions about is our biosphere inevitable? Are the types of organisms we see inevitable? And that might be one of the most exciting things about finding life on another planet, is to get beyond these uh, very difficult limitations in trying to decide what is inevitable about the evolution of life and what is contingent. Well, your, if I was asking the question about your existence, your n equals one, right? Um, and how about the existence of another you? Should we go looking for another U so we'd have an N equals 2? What do you mean by another U? 
or what do you mean by another life? Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the desire to find um, another biosphere, preferably with something where the, uh, the organisms there have gone beyond a single cell state and have formed more complex uh, organisms where we could look at these transitions in evolution that we see on the earth going from uh, microorganisms to uh, eukaryotes to complex eukaryotes and intelligence. I mean, these major transitions, it would be good to find a planet that is sufficiently advanced where you could see whether those transitions have occurred. I mean, of course, even that is fraught with problems. If you found a microbial world, is it just that it hasn't yet reached these transitions that are inevitable, but they just haven't occurred, or is it that these uh, transitions are not inevitable? So you'd really have to start looking at the geochemistry of the planet to try and think about, well, is there something that stopped these organisms from going on to complexity, or does it reflect the fact that um, more complex uh, life is, is just um, contingent or extremely unlikely? So even if you find another biosphere, it's just microbial, what does that actually tell you? I don't know. We'd have to look at the geology, I think. Is there oxygen in the atmosphere? Do we see a microbial biosphere that's got lots of oxygen in the atmosphere from photosynthesis, but there's no animals? That would be interesting. <laughs> then perhaps those sorts of biospheres might actually tell us something about the inevitability or non-inevitability of these transitions. Well, what do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, again, one of those questions that's interesting, there's no real good data, so sort of wild speculation. I happen to think that the distances between stars are just so vast that one explanation for the Fermi paradox is that these distances are just too great to communicate or travel over. I mean, at the moment, there's no good physics to suggest that we really can communicate or go faster than the speed of light. Uh, and so when you think about the distances between stars, it just seems like a very difficult thing to do. I think we live... So the analogy I would give is this, and it's a slightly philosophical analogy. When you're young, you think you can achieve anything. And then at some point, you realize that you're mortal and that you're going to die. And if I was to say to you, oh, I, I really want to be around to see what's happened in astrobiology in 300 years' time, you're not going to say to me, well, stop being so negative. You should have a more positive view of your future. You just accept the fact that it's not going to happen. As a civilization, we currently have this view that we're immortal, we're going to build a spacefaring civilization, travel across the galaxy, meet other civilizations. And for that reason, we sit around scratching our heads thinking, the Fermi paradox, what's that about? It doesn't, it doesn't fit with our view of our future. Maybe at some point, we're going to have to confront the fact that the laws of physics to set a glass ceiling to our technological capacities and traveling thousands or tens of thousands of light years uh, to other stars or even communicating with other intelligences. It's just not possible to do. If you live in it, maybe there are a few civilizations out there in star clusters where they're close enough to one another that there's communication. There may well be civilizations out there with the privilege to talk to one another. But it may be that the more common aspect or the, the more common outcome is that there are intelligences that sort of flicker in and out across the galaxy over time, but they never communicate with one another. And I think there's a real possibility that we will explore our solar system. We may even launch interstellar missions to our nearest stars. Uh, we may go slightly beyond. But that might be it. And our civilization may be destined to live out its life and die primarily in the solar system. And I think that's something that um, a lot of people are not willing to accept. But it would be, for me at least, the most logical and parsimonious explanation for the Fermi paradox, because it fits with the laws of physics, it fits with these vast distances and, um, uh, and the problems of, of traveling and communicating over these sorts of distances. So you don't subscribe to my preferred solution, which is human-like technological civilization is not a convergent feature of evolution and we shouldn't expect it to evolve elsewhere. Um, I think they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. I mean, it, it, uh, of course, it's a different explanation if we really believe it has never happened anywhere else. But it may also feed into the general idea that if it does happen, it's extremely rare because it's not inevitable. And if it has happened elsewhere, it's in another galaxy somewhere else. So your explanation uh, might be part of the underlying reason for the fact that distances to the nearest intelligent civilization are even greater than the most optimistic people might care to assume, uh, which would simply reinforce this idea that it's just unlikely that intelligent civilizations communicate with one another. The distances are vast. They're made possibly even more vast 
by the rarity of, in, of intelligence. Well, I would argue that it's, there's probability of zero for human-like intelligence. What do you think of that idea? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to, um, to, to construct uh, an empirically based argument. Going back to our discussion earlier, um, I, I think we just don't know whether intelligence is an inevitable result of evolution once you have animals, complex life on a planet. Um, and, I, and I would go back to my previous point about having uh, the dinosaurs there for 165 million years ago, but apparently no selection pressure for intelligence that leads to a civilization over that long period of time, although they dominated the major ecological niches. Earth, animals. land, and water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so the, you know, that doesn't necessarily tell us it's not inevitable. It may tell us that um, it, it, the timing is not inevitable. You can have large organisms dominating a planet for many hundreds of millions of years, maybe without transitioning into intelligence. I still don't think we really truly understand the evolutionary selection pressure that led to intelligence. And only when we know that can we really tell whether there are environments that are likely or common on a planet that force an evolution towards intelligence. Until we know that, giving an opinion on the idea that the probability is zero and there's no other intelligence, I think is just a very difficult thing to do. But, but as you rightly say, you know, the, the Fermi paradox is, no, is not a paradox. There's, there are no intelligence, as far as we can sell, see, landing on the Earth. So it's, it's a simple observation that needs an explanation. Uh, and that could be one explanation for it. But, but, but again, uh, just to make a point, uh, the Fermi paradox is yet another discussion that I think has a fascinating input into evolutionary biology. You very rarely um, find this as a, as a discussion in evolutionary biology, and I think it's because it's probably very speculative, it's difficult to get a handle on it. But the one thing it does do is force you to start asking these questions about the inevitability of evolutionary transitions. Uh, and the Fermi paradox, I think, is a particularly uh, intriguing question for driving questions in evolutionary biology. Mm. Um, in the movie Contact, at the end, you've seen the movie? Yes, I have. At yeah. the end, well, I forget what happens at the there's end. an end, there's a little child, mm -hmm. and who asks Jodie Foster, are we alone? Mm -hmm. And Jodie says, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. <laughs> what do you think of that answer? Well, again, I think it's, um, I would go back to Sagan's comment, it has an appealing rhetorical resonance, but I'm not quite sure what that means. It would be an awful waste of space. I, waste is a very human uh, view of things. I don't see why the universe cares whether we're around or not. So um, if we're alone, um, I don't think it's a waste of space. I think stars and galaxies are pretty spectacular things, actually. And I think there's a lot of interesting phenomena out there that are interesting to look at. But I mean, uh, unless, I mean, even if we weren't around to observe that, why would that be a waste in whose, in whose frame of mind? It would only be a waste because it, it gives us less uh, biology to study in the future. It's a waste of, of um, interesting science on alien biospheres that we might do if we were to ever find life in our own solar system or, or nearby. But I mean, outside of that, what is the waste? What does that actually mean? So I think it's... Um, I think it's what the British said when they came to Australia. They called it terra nullis. They said, what a waste of space. No <laughs> Brits here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but that's a slightly different view. That's a waste of space, i.e. There's, there's land here that we could do something with. So if you want to look at it from that point of view, if there's no one else out there but there are habitable worlds, then you could look at that as, what a waste of space, why don't we move in? Um, it has its own set of interesting questions and ethical questions. But I think um, th that's a more practical take on what a waste of space. But uh, on a more philosophical level, I, I don't quite understand what that point is that, it's a waste of space if there's nothing else out there. It's just a, a fact of the universe, if that's the case. There's okay. no wastage there. Now, if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat, you have to spend this money to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. I, one of the things I would do first is go for, I think, some... Um, uh, environments and watery environments in our own solar system that we could get to relatively easily to see whether there is life. I think the plumes of Enceladus, for example, um, I'm surprised that there isn't an immediate decision to go for sample return from that moon, given we've got organic matter in liquid water. Uh, 
that that is an obvious place to try and answer that question in our own solar system. So I think there are, what's exciting about astrobiology, I think, is in the last few decades with these discoveries like plumes of water with organics coming from Enceladus, is there are obvious places to go now and collect samples to try and answer that question. So that's one of the things I would do. Um, I, uh, I think there's a lot to be done on, on the Earth in terms of understanding uh, alternative types of biochemistry and biology. I would love to see slightly more wild work being done on um, alternatives to uh, carbon biochemistry. I, I happen to think that's probably the best way of making living things. I'm not really convinced by alternatives, but having said that, there's an interesting possible um, branch of chemistry in exploring that in more depth about the, the chemical contingency of life, uh, different types of genetic codes. So I certainly give money to all the synthetic biologists and chemists looking at trying to understand the universality of, of biology on the earth and, and whether you can construct different types of biology. I think there's a lot to be learned there. And then finally, I think um, looking for biosignatures in, in exoplanet atmospheres is a very promising way, necessarily limited. I can think of lots of ways in which you can have a habitable or an inhabited planet that has no obvious biosignature, I mean, anaerobic worlds where it may be very difficult to tell what's in, whether there's life there just from atmospheric constituents. But it would seem that a promising direction is to get some statistical handle on the number of Earth-like worlds, or rocky worlds at least, uh, in the near neighbourhood that have an oxygen biosignature, for example. So that, I think, is making great strides and is worth putting funding into as well. No upgrade to SETI like Yuri Milner has done with $100 million? I think SETI is a good thing to do just because in terms of the cost versus the potential benefit of it worked, um, it's worth pursuing. Uh, and uh, who knows, we might find something. I think the results so far are disappointing. And I have, um, as I've expressed earlier, uh, a personal, I'm going to call it a prejudice, just to be safe as a scientist, a prejudice that we cannot travel these vast distances based on what we know. And, and that is my view of the Fermi paradox, that it's very difficult to communicate in reasonable time spans uh, or travel anywhere in reasonable time spans. And I think that's why we don't see anything. And I think we will not find anything, um, okay. any, any signals. But uh, given, given the, the expense there and the possibility of piggybacking these, uh, these SETI programs on existing um, searches using radio telescopes for other things and optical SETI as well, you can do these things relatively cheaply for a few million. I know that sounds a lot to most people, but actually, as I say, if you did find something, the outcome would be extraordinary. So I think carrying on SETI is a good thing. I'm not sure I would spend 100 million on it, but, you know, we live in... I, I also... Uh, not an astrobiologically related thing, but I, I believe very much in, in free societies where people can choose what they want to do with their money. And if some, someone out there who's got 100 million and they want to spend that on SETI, um, then spend it on SETI. Well, I've just given you 100 billion. Oh, yeah. Well, and 100 you're not billion. even going to spend 100 million on SETI. I, I would. <laughs> I can see all the SETI people are going to come and kill me now. I would, even if I had 100 billion, um, I would want to sit down and think whether 100 million on SETI was was worth it. I would want to look and see whether we could whether we could use existing telescopes and give uh, a few uh, tens of millions, maybe 10 million, maybe to different groups to look at uh, exoplanets. I might also think maybe we should wait a bit and find an exoplanet that's got oxygen in its atmosphere, and then give some money to SETI rather than just blindly spending 100 million on. Well, how, about, how about investing in uh, better microscopes to look for nano aliens? Um, you mean nano uh, scale machines that might have been put here? Why not? I've never even thought of that, actually. It's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about, how about looking to try to figure out if we're inside of an alien? Uh, you mean the universe or the Earth or. I don't know, you know, you're, you have neurons, and presumably those neurons do not know they're inside of you. And so that's an interesting metaphor. I'm wondering if there's anything like that that could apply to us. 
It's a little like living inside of a yeah, simulation, yeah, yeah. for example. Exactly. No, I, th I think that's, a, again, it's an interesting question, but difficult to, um, to con again, it's not my area. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying from my knowledge, I would think that's difficult c to conceive of an experimental program to get at that question. You look for but a glitch. Might... You look for a glitch. Didn't you see the matrix? Yes. I, I, <laughs> you look for a glitch. Yeah, sure. But how do you then, how do you constrain that in terms of a practical lab-based experimental program and what sort of glitches? I'm not saying there are. I'd say this is not my area. I would certainly be willing to sit down if I had my hundred billion yeah. with those people who think that they do have the, the knowledge of how to do that and see whether they have an experimental program that within a few years could lead to real results where there's some hypothesis testing. And if someone says they do, uh, then yeah, out of my hundred billion, I would give them some money for sure. But from, from where I, I sit, I, I, I've never seen anyone at least publish a paper where they propose a hypothesis-based experimental program to find the glitch, but it's an interesting <laughs> idea. Okay. Now, let, you've, you talked to me with using your rational side. I was hoping that now you could now close your eyes, get in touch with the emotion, okay. emotional side of yourself, and I'll ask the question, uh, what kind of aliens would you like to find emotionally? Um, I would like to find aliens that, uh, that have an interest in, in understanding how out of the blind processes of organic chemistry a civilization sh should find for itself a long-term purpose and goal that is not preordained by any process in the natural world but which we have to find for ourselves and finding an intelligence that has come from a, a different environment maybe has a different perspective on the universe has lived under a different sun but shares that interest in what is all this about and what are we going to do for the next 10,000, 100,000, million years of our civilization, maybe longer. Uh, what is their view on that? Have they thought about that? Um, and I think it would be fascinating to sit down at a table with a, a beer or they can drink whatever their alien equivalent is and just have a chat about these ideas of, of meaning. That again, again, it's difficult to know what meaning means because I don't think there is any, any, any preset meaning. But how you give your civilization a sense of a purpose other than just nihilistically living on a planet if you're destroying it. So I'd love to know uh, what aliens think about that question. So you would love to meet a wiser and more educated version of yourself? Yes, exactly. Maybe a civilization has had much longer to think about this, has maybe uh, been around on its planet uh, for many millions of years, and the civilization has had a lot longer to contemplate this question. So you want to meet God? God would be great. I'll settle for aliens that have been around for a few million years longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have you, ever, have you ever seen a UFO? No. No? You've never seen an unidentified flying object? No. Well, let's, let's rephrase that. I've never seen something in the sky that I do not believe is, is, ex, is explainable by <laughs> uh, artifice from human civilization. I've never, I, I've never seen anything that I'm just sitting around thinking, I'm really convinced that came from another planet. No. Okay. Now, you've taught astrobiology, so yeah. what do you think are among the biggest misconceptions that students have about astrobiology? Well, there's a trivial misconception, which, which is very trivial, which is it's all about looking for green aliens. And of course, you know, that is part of the question, are we alone in the universe? But astrobiology is more than that. It's about understanding the origin of life on Earth and how our own biosphere came into existence. And in trying to answer that, trying to understand life on Earth, it, it, we want to extrapolate that knowledge to thinking about life beyond Earth. So, Coming at the subject thinking it's all about aliens isn't entirely wrong, but it's this perception that that's all that it's about. Astrobiologists are just a bunch of people that are, might just as well be a UFO convention, but they're slightly more scientific. And that's the first thing you have to overcome. The second thing I think that is a misconception is that many people think that astrobiology is somehow, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but let me put it very simply, an easy science. I see students come into my course and think, Oh, I want to do astrobiology because it's really interesting and involves looking for alien life and I don't want to do uh, physics because that's difficult and, and I just don't want to do that, I want to do astrobiology. And I often have to explain to my students, astrobiology is actually more difficult than many other subjects because you have to know all those other subjects. It's, a, it's an amalgamation of subjects. To be an astrobiologist you still have to have 
a, a core training in, in a conventional science because there's no such thing as disciplines. Disciplines are artificial words that, that humans make up. There's just a universe about which a civilization can, can ask questions. And astrobiology just happens to be a subset of very interesting questions that require you to cross what are traditional disciplines um, to understand uh, the universe in which we live and, and how likely uh, planets are, Earth-like planets. You have to know something about astrophysics and star formation and stellar evolution. That's physics and astrophysics. To understand how self-replicating molecules emerge, you have to go and talk to what we would conventionally call chemists. If you want to look at complex multicellular organisms, you've got to go and talk to people in a building who call themselves biologists. Uh, so actually astrobiology is a very challenging subject because very few of its questions sit within a traditional discipline. You have to cross disciplines and that means you have to be ready to talk to different people who maybe don't want to talk to you and say, you're a biologist, I don't want to talk to you, I'm, a, I'm an astronomer or a chemist. That's hard work. Um, so it's intellectually hard work to cross those boundaries and it's intellectually hard work to assimilate the quantity of knowledge to be able to address an astrobiology question in a, in a scientifically robust and credible way. And that's fanta fantastic. It's what makes astrobiology so interesting. And what also makes it interesting is the fact that it does attract these people who cross disciplinary boundaries. And they're usually very fun people to talk to, intellectually expansive people. But going back to your question, it does mean that you have to make students realize that you're actually getting involved in a subject that is a very challenging subject. It's not just a way out of conventional disciplines and asking some interesting questions where you can avoid having to be part of um, existing disciplines that can be quite conservative. You're actually going to have to go up against three or four conservative disciplines to be an astrobiologist. So that's an interesting misperception. But when students come out of the other end, uh, it's very rewarding for them because they realize that uh, there are huge opportunities there. I think somebody who's teasingly referred to bioastronomy or astrobiology as a discipline without a subject matter. Uh, what, do you, what do you say about that? Um, I, I would go back to the point that it's not just about searching for aliens. Um, uh, it's about understanding life on Earth, so we have quite a lot of subject matter. In fact, over three and a half billion years worth of subject matter. If you go out and look at the diversity of life on Earth uh, and try to understand where it came from, there's quite a lot to look at. But the other thing I would say is that um, as we start to explore other planets, the discovery of the lack of life is not no data, that's data. The discovery of even a planet like Venus, you know, planets in our own solar system that we, well, we think are lifeless. I mean, there are some people that argue otherwise for Venus, but let's just ignore that for the, point of, for the, for the moment and, and simply point out there are planets that do not have life in our, in our solar system. That's astrobiological data. It's about understanding the limits of life and the environments in which life might have emerged. So again, I've never really understood the point it's a subject without any data apart from the obvious trivial observation that we haven't got aliens. But that, I think, is a rather facile view of, of astrobiology and, and the study of the universe and biology's place in the universe. Do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Yeah, I, I often get asked this. And when I say often, I, I, I mean these days, almost once or twice a week, I will get emails from students primarily uh, because of the courses I teach, asking how do I become an astrobiologist? Um, uh, and the advice I give is very simple, and it's simply to tell them, I mean, I even have a, a version of an email now that I cut and paste, not because I can't be bothered to respond to people individually, but because it's always the same question. The point is this, that astrobiology, that I go back to my point that disciplines are artificial human constructions. Astrobiology is a set of questions about the universe. If you want to address those questions, like the origin of life, is there life on other planets? Uh, what makes a planet habitable? The first thing to do is think about what area of science that broadly encapsulates a set of questions am I most interested in? If you're interested in um, uh, the laws that underpin matter, ultimately life, you might want to go into physics and you're mathematically minded, then do physics, learn about physics, get a good physics degree, and then use that to address questions in astrobiology. If you're someone that has uh, an affinity with, with biology and understanding microbes, plants or animals, whatever it is, 
then go and do a biology degree or an evolutionary biology degree, and then when you've done that, then use that knowledge to address questions in astrobiology and so on and so forth. But the most important thing is not to become um, a fluffy scientist that's trying to do a bit of physics and astronomy because you're interested in exoplanets, trying to do a bit of biology because suddenly you've got interested in you know, uh, the evolution of life on Earth, trying to do some chemistry because you've um, got interested in the origin of life. Start off your academic career, at least at university, by focusing in on one area of science and getting really good at that. Uh, and that is where I would slightly contradict myself, but I don't think it is a contradiction, which is to say, start off in a conventional area where you can get a really good degree and get depth of knowledge. And then with that depth of knowledge, go out into astrobiology and expand into breadth. And then as you go forward in your career, you'll always have that one area of science where you've got really good depth. And someone will know, yeah, that's the chemist that does astrobiology, or that's the physicist who knows all about uh, life in the universe. And then you can come in as someone who can bring a depth of understanding to astrobiology questions. So in summary, what I tell students is pick a good area of science where there's good depth of knowledge, and as a result, it's become a conventional career. Do well in that, and then join the astrobiology community in the meantime. Come to our conferences and learn about the astrobiology of questions and apply that. What do you think of the Gaia hypothesis? I think it's a very difficult thing to get your claws into. I mean, clearly the Earth um, is, a, is a, a connected um, set of a very large number of organisms where there are many feedbacks. Uh, and in the sense that a change or a gross change in part of the biosphere may be triggered by some geochemical change in the planet, which might itself be caused by life, will cause a rearrangement in the biosphere. You can view that as an organism. Um, uh, responding in some way. Uh, I, I don't impute biology with any forethought, and that's where there is some gray area in, in, in the Gaia hypothesis, perhaps the view that some people take, which is to push it into the realms where the biosphere is changing itself in some way to uh, allow for uh, either more resilience in the biosphere or more complexity. I mean, the canonical suggestion maybe is the rise of oxygen allowing for um, animal life and this is part of a sort of planetary scale uh, rearrangement. I, I think that there's, there's examples of, um, of things that happen in the biosphere that clearly lead to extinctions and we see extinctions. So I don't think the biosphere is going anywhere in particular. <laughs> it will, it will, it will self-regulate. You will see patterns in it like increasing complexity simply because I think things will cooperate if you put uh, cells on a planet, one person's food will be another person's, or another, one person's waste will be another person's food. So you will inevitably get complexity uh, emerging on a, on a planetary scale, and that might give you the illusion of the planet somehow self-regulating as an organism and gaining complexity and modifying its environment to, in order to enhance its, its, um, its long-term persistence, but I don't really buy that. I think biology is replicating matter with a code in it that, res that creates populations of replicating entities that then are selected by the environment. I don't think there's anything particularly complex in that. And once it gets going on a planet, it will increase in complexity just because you get more of that matter that's interacting. There will be uh, interacting networks of, of matter, the gases they produce, the waste products. So you think the increase in complexity is a feature of universal if there is life elsewhere, that they, it too would become more complex with time? I think so, yeah. I think it will do. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and what, I wrote a paper once and the conclusion was we need a paradigm shift from we eat food to food has created us to eat it. What do you think of that idea? Um, <laughs> depends what you mean by food. <laughs> well, I mean by food a redox gradient. Uh, or any type of gradient, pressure gradient, temperature gradient, uh, humidity gradient, all the things that give us free, that give, uh, that provide free energy f mm -hmm. for the dissipative structures that form from it. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I, these sorts of discussions, are, I, they're great to have. I love having these discussions over pints of beer. I'm not sure they have any deep meaning. I think redox couples exist. And I mean, 
to but see, do they see create, a but do the existence of the redox couples create structures that have the function of undoing the gradient? That, yeah, was, that well, was the point. Yes, absolutely. Well, again, I, that's, uh, I'm going to be careful how far I go into that because I'm not a chemist. I think it goes back to uh, where those first self-replicating um, molecules came from and where they got their free energy in replication, what the origin, for example, of the proton gradient is that's, that's used to create ATP in, in um, most life on Earth. So whether, whether those things were derived out of chemical disequilibria and therefore the life forms that now use those chemical disequilibria arose from those mm -hmm. uh, chemical disequilibria, I think it's a reasonable possibility. I mean, chemical disequilibria were probably necessary to generate the energy to create complex organic compounds and, and, and generate the cascade of chemical reactions uh, that allowed for the emergence of, if we believe this is the case, the, the RNA world and ribozymes and self-replicating RNA molecules. Which then has a metabolism exactly. to undo the gradient that exactly. produced it. Exactly. So it's not a crazy idea? or you? No, I don't think it is a crazy idea. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a question, as I say, I, it, it, it's, it's, it's a question I think we need to know more about the origin of the earliest metabolisms and whether they were linked to, uh, how strongly they were linked to mineral environments where you had these chemical disequilibria to understand that cause-effect relationship between chemical disequilibria, the emergence of life forms that then use that free energy to multiply themselves. But it's an interesting point. I don't think it's a crazy, uh, a crazy idea at all. Okay, um, are we alone? We, we want to find that out. I think it's still one of the most profound questions that's ever been asked by the human mind. And as has been said before, it's a hackneyed response, but I still think it's, it's, a, it's a cliche because cliches become a, a cliches for a reason. The answer to that question either way is absolutely fascinating. But to, to discover that we're, we are alone, well, of course, that's difficult to find, to, to, to prove that in the known universe, but if we find that out in the local neighborhood, uh, that would be as profound as, as finding other types of life, whether that's microbial intelligence. So I think answering that question would be fascinating either way, and that is why uh, it's such a great question, because it's not a question that's got a boring answer or an interesting answer. Either answer is extremely profound for our understanding of our place in the universe. That's why I think it has, has such a hold on the population from children uh, right the way through to astrobiologists. Do you have a favorite movie in which there are aliens? Um, I have to say I, I read War of the Worlds when I was about seven um, and that had a, that's always been my favorite science fiction uh, account. In terms of the, the, the film versions of that, perhaps not my uh, favorite ones, but they are my favorite just because the original story has always had uh, such a hold on me. I think that's sort of a fascinating, um, uh, fascinating scenario for finding alien life. Not the most positive scenario, but it involves microbes and other microbiologists, so I sort of like that. Um, I happen to think, I mean, one of the things I always find disappointing about Hollywood is there actually aren't any really good films that talk about the consequences of contact with extraterrestrial intelligence without some crazy time travel stuff thrown in there or something else that's either outside the current realms of physics or is unrealistic. I still wish someone would come up with a really good film about the social consequences of contacting extraterrestrial intelligence without any of the craziness. A real look at uh, almost a sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, documentary isn't the right word, but a sort of uh, fiction version of what might happen. I don't think you have to go for things like interstellar with time travel to capture the fascination of the potential consequences of uh, contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. So I just wish someone would make a film that is, that is rooted in good science, but speculates about the, the implications of finding life. I think there's an opportunity there. Well, I think for, there was a five-minute sequence in contact in which Jodie Foster is trying to drive back to her telescopes, and then there's a gigantic circus of different reactions from religious to scientific to geekish yeah. to, hey, yeah. cool aliens, mm -hmm. and the, that, mm -hmm. that showed a variety of reactions to, yeah. at least from the American yeah. public, to that. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, or? I think that sort of thing. 
uh, yeah. Because you're interested in what happens if we do find aliens and trying to anticipate what might happen to us. Yeah, I think partly, I mean, there's partly the, the, the interest in really trying to think what, what would happen. But I think also you can make a film about that for the general public that would, that would leave people going out of the movie theatre really quite stunned. And in fact, the more realistic you made it, I think the more of an impact you could have with it. Um, you walk out of something like Interstellar and, you know, no one really goes out thinking, well, that's really realistic, you know, give it another 50 years and we're all going to be doing that and going through time travel. I think you could have quite a profound impact on people and their view of this question by making a film that's rooted in science but captures the, uh, the philosophical implications of finding life elsewhere and make people leave that, lecture, leave that uh, movie theatre thinking, um, wow, it doesn't matter what the answer to this question is, this is going to be astonishing to find the answer to this. Well, you're a, a biologist, a microbiologist, and so you're interested in uh, bacteria elsewhere, but most people couldn't care about bacteria. They are like your emotional self and they're looking for a wiser version, they're looking for God yeah. or some wise English-speaking person who can solve all their problems. Yeah. So uh, what ha would happen if it were just uh, you find bacteria? You and your biological colleagues would be happy, but the rest of the community yeah. probably wouldn't care very much. No, I, I, I mean, I think that the reaction that people think would happen is slightly over-exaggerated. The, the, the analogy I give to my students is we have actually lived through a period of civilization where people thought there was extraterrestrial intelligence. You go back to the, 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 the 17th and 18th century, and you have people like Herschel writing about beings on the moon. I mean, they were convinced about this. And there's discussions about alien intelligences on, on, on Venus and Jupiter. Um, we have been through a period of human history. Um, after the, uh, the invention of the telescope, but before the space program where we could really see these planets well and constrain physical conditions, where people really thought that these new planets must have life on them. Uh, and did it have any effect on people's view of society when people were absolutely convinced there were aliens? No, not at all. People wrote books about it, people were mad about it, and they talked about it, but it didn't reduce the number of wars, it didn't elevate us to a higher level of thinking. So I, I think in some sense we have actually already experienced the consequences, uh, if not of the actual discovery of, of extraterrestrial intelligence, but being in a civilization that has the mindset that there is something out there. Uh, my own view is cynical, um, is that people would get very excited by it for a short period of time, but then how does it affect everyday, uh, everyday life? Not much. So people just go on their lives, uh, getting on with what they're doing. In fact, the only way I could see that it would have a truly um, profound impact is if we looked down a telescope one day and saw a fleet of alien spaceships in our solar system then I think it really would focus people for a significant <laughs> length of time. <laughs> the sort of, de the E.T. Damocles, sorry. Yeah. Now, I had talked to a student in India, and I asked him this question, if I give you $100 billion, and the caveat you have to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? And he said, well, I would spend it on poverty reduction programs. And, uh, and I said, what do you mean by that? What does that have to do with answering the question, are we alone? And he said, well, if you, to answer the question, are we alone, we have to, be, we have to maintain our own existence. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, pre, that's the prerequisite for finding aliens is to live, mm -hmm. to exist. Mm -hmm. And apparently the in economic inequalities are so large that we're yeah. threatening our own existence. But you didn't want to spend any money on that. Oh, uh, no, I did not exclude that. I was, <laughs> I was working from the default assumption that I had a hundred billion to spend on astrobiology and the search for life. And that uh, you would continue to exist. Uh, but, but if that includes um, prerequisites, <laughs> for, I just assumed that we had a civilization that was existing and had the capacity Oh, you assumed that we would continue yeah. to exist? Oh, now that seems like a silly assumption. Well, Stephen Hawking just no, said no. that we probably will only live a thousand years. Oh, right, okay, no, so, okay, so let's be clear about this. The assumption I made was you're giving me money at the current time with a civilization and my money must be spent on is there life elsewhere? So I was thinking about how I would advance that specific question. But if the money is available to think about, to, to, to shore up 
the civilization to make sure we can continue to ask that question. Well, that's a different thing. And, oh, yeah. Well, I didn't know that. So you think we're, <laughs> our civilization is so stable it doesn't need shoring up if we're going to live for 100 years or something? You know? uh, no, I'm just thinking of how I would spend 100 billion immediately on the search. Immediately? The, the oh. specific search for are oh, we alone in the universe and what I was going to do with that money if it I appeared see, in my I bank see. account. But, but if but if the money <laughs> if the money is also going to be spent on ensuring there's a civilization to ask this question, well, right, okay. Well, I'm we'll asking you, I'm giving you the money thing. You have to help answer the question, are we alone? Yeah. And if you think that we're going to, civilization's going to crash in 10 minutes, you'd probably spend all of that money and <laughs> trying to yeah. make it not crash, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, you know, he, the, the point he raises is, of course, an important one, which is where do you draw the line in, in, your, in the allocation of resources uh, in solving the problems which in some countries do amount to um, abject poverty and simply the desire to exist. Uh, poverty is always going to exist on the planet. You're never going to get rid of it. So if your objective is to remove all poverty, then we're not going to do any astrobiology, we're not going to do any astronomy either. I don't, I don't think his objective was to remove all poverty, no. but to, to so, so remove enough is, of it so that exactly. we wouldn't last, yeah. wouldn't create gigantic yeah. wars and us yeah. we kill ourselves. So, so where is that line? And you know, I don't have an answer to that. It's the perennial question. But this question has never gone away. Everyone has a different answer. How much, how much poverty and how many problems do you solve? Um, I, I think you have to solve all these problems, but how much money you allocate to solving poverty versus uh, astrobiology, you know, we're, all, we're always arguing about that, and I would think that the answer to that, and it's a slightly, it's a slightly tangential discussion, is what sort of society is the best society for having that ongoing conversation that can be self-correcting. For me, that's a, a democratic society where science is healthy and where people can have this discussion. Our views about how much money we spend on poverty may be different in 50 years, in 100 years from what it is now. And the important thing is that all of us in society are engaged in a conversation about how we allocate those resources. But to have that conversation, I completely agree with him, the first thing you do have to have is basic level of education. I think education, for me, is that foundation part of civilization, getting as many people as possible to a level where they can engage in that conversation about what you do with humanity's resources and how much money we do spend on astrobiology. And it's a difficult, you know, it's a difficult one because some, some countries are so, uh, so poor, it's going to take substantially more than 100 billion to solve that problem. I mean, what about poverty in Africa? I mean, do we ensure that Africa comes up to the same level of ed as education uh, as the rest of us before we spend money on astrobiology? What proportion of humanity has to be educated before you start giving them more money to think about life beyond, um, uh, life beyond the earth? Uh, what percentage of humanity living in abject poverty is acceptable. So if you were starving, you wouldn't care about astrobiology, I guess? I think that's a reasonable assumption. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, and I think, you know, it sounds a trivial question, but then why am I comfortable spending money on astrobiology when I know someone else is starving to death? Uh, what sort of morality is that? Shouldn't I spend my time? I have an intellect. I have a university degree. Why am I not helping them do that? I think these are very, very difficult questions to, to answer. And it doesn't mean to say I don't care about it. It means I try and put my intellect in places where I think I can do the best use. And I did a degree in biochemistry, and I happen to be a microbiologist. And astrobiology is something that fires me up. And sometimes things that fire you up are also the best places to put your energy, because you put it in that direction in the most invigorated manner. Um, but I think there are questions about you know, how, how we manage the rest of civilization that is in poverty while we answer these questions. I would also say they're not mutually exclusive, right? I mean, asking questions like that does inspire people, and sometimes that inspiration can lead people to, um, to make improvements in their own economies, in their own countries, the, the, the aspiration to do good science. I mean, you look at the science that's going on in India. Yeah, there are huge inequalities that the Indian population are going to have to deal with, but there's no doubt in saying that their movements into computers and robotics is generally elevating the economic situation in that country. And if that economy is, is managed in the right way, it should be possible to pull more people out of poverty from the results of that economic development in India. So I don't think these, these things are disconnected either. Okay, so we've solved the universe's problems. Getting there. <laughs> A few more beers yet and we'll be there. <laughs>